welcome to everyone today. Glad that you can be part of our, our worship at the First Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City. It has been a particularly stressful time the last, oh, week, week and a half, two weeks. I think you all know to what I am referring. The odd thing is that uh, you may all well be aware, but I was struck that the person that seems to be quoted the most, in fact, there isn't a day that goes by, where I don't see any reference to Abraham Lincoln. Who? I think that kind of gives us an idea of how, how dark a time it really is that we are currently living through. I'm very fortunate in that I will be on my four-week sabbatical leave starting next week. I wished I could take all of you with me because uh, it's so great to get away, unplug, regroup. Um, I feel very, very fortunate and blessed to have that opportunity. During my absence, if there is a ministerial need that arises, please do not hesitate to, to contact the Reverend Monica Dobbins or actually our assistant administrator as well, and that's Stephanie Park. Their contact numbers are on the website, and do not hesitate, and they will be very, very helpful in figuring out next steps. But today, today we are honored to celebrate the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I want to recognize especially as we are struggling as a nation that's so divided, Dr. King's emphasis on nonviolence. We cannot hear enough about his very basic uh, political and human principle, and that is the art of nonviolence to make your persuasive uh, case in point, uh, and we can do that with love in our hearts if we want to heal our nation. And so I'll be thinking about Dr. King, obviously throughout the service, but also right this moment as I prepare to light our chalice. Symbol of light and of knowledge. Symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Thank you. 
people reflect on the civil rights protests of the 1960s. Often the images that come up for them are protesters marching across the Pettus Bridge or gathered on the National Mall. Today, I want us to remember a series of marches in Birmingham, Alabama in the spring of 1963, which was held by a thousand children in the fight for desegregation. These brave children faced the kind of protest we've seen before, with a violent government trying to uphold white supremacy at all costs. Let us remember this American history as we continue the fight for justice today. Let the Children March by Monica Clark Robinson, illustrated by Frank Morrison. 1963, Birmingham, Alabama. I couldn't play on the same playground as the white kids. I couldn't go to their school. I couldn't drink from their water fountains. There were so many things I couldn't do. One warm spring night, my family went to church. We weren't there to have regular services. We were there to hear Dr. King speak. We were there to plan. He wanted to raise an army of peaceful protesters to fight for freedom. His brown eyes flashing fire and love Dr. King told us the time had come to march. If I march, Mama said, I'll lose my job, sure enough. I can't march, Daddy said. I got a family to feed. The weight of the world rested on our parents' shoulders, but this burden, this time, didn't have to be theirs to bear. I don't have a boss to fear, my brother said or job to lose. We can march this time. We'll be Dr. King's army, I said. It'll be fine, Daddy, I promised. Don't worry, Mama. Dr. King didn't like children being put in harm's way. He was a daddy too, after all. But he said that though we were young, we were not too young to want our freedom. Let the children march. They will lead the way. On May 2nd, a sunny Thursday, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends, we all met at the church, dressed in our best, feet ready. In a silence so loud that all I could hear was my racing heart, we began to walk. Hand in hand we marched, so frightened, yet certain of what was right for freedom. The path may be long and troubled, but I'm gonna walk on. Would I be hurt? Would I be heard? Would it all be worth it in the end? I wanted to run away from the angry faces in the crowd, run from danger, run from fear. Boys and girls, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends, on and on we marched, we marched, we marched, singing the songs of freedom. One thousand strong we came. Hate dogged my heels all that day, its yellowed canine teeth sharp, but courage walked by my side and kept me going. Disperse or you'll be jailed, the police shouted on the first day. Disperse or you'll get wet, the police shouted the second day. Disperse or we'll release the dogs. The police shouted the third day. We did not disperse. We kept marching. We wouldn't stop until things started to change. Hundreds of us went to jail on the first day and even more on the second. My turn wasn't until the third day. After I was sprayed by water stronger than anything I've ever felt, Rough hands pushed me forward, and I fell to my knees in the police wagon. I was going to jail. Dr. King reassured our parents. Don't worry about your children, he said. They're going to be all right. Don't hold them back if they want to go to jail, for they are doing a job for not only themselves, 
but for all of America and for all mankind. That night, crowded into a cell too small for even half of the kids, we sang, We shall overcome. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. And freedom is coming. Our parents couldn't be there with us, but still we sang, wrapped in the proud and loving arms of our ancestors. I was still in jail, but we heard that the next day and the next, more kids marched. The water hoses they used to sting us could not stop the our fierce tide. The path may be long and troubled, but I'm gonna march on. Turn the other cheek we had been taught. Show love where there is hate. The world watched as hate bruised us. But for seven days, we walked only in love. The jails swelled to bursting, and even President Kennedy took notice. Daddy said the president received letters and calls about us from all over the world. Our march would become a memory a small part of a larger story. But we had been heard, and the seeds of revolution were sown. Two days and nights, I stayed in the jail. Some stayed even longer. When I left, I was tired and sore, and my best dress was ripped. But my smile was as wide as the Mississippi River. I had made a difference. I am so proud of you, baby girl, Mama said. Your marching was what made them see. With nothing more than our feet, voices, and courage, we had done what others could not. Change was right around the corner. We felt it like the cool breeze in an Alabama August. On May 10th, the great news rang out. Dr. King had reached an agreement with the white leaders of the city. Desegregation would begin. One month later, I was playing on a playground I'd never been allowed to play on before. Two months later, my family ate at a diner we'd never been allowed to eat in before. Our march made the difference. We children led the way. Singing the songs of freedom, one thousand strong we came in the fallout of the white supremacist insurrection at our nation's capital on january 6th there have been calls for unity from the right calls from conservative politicians to heal our country so we can move forward together these calls for unity were often delivered with the right hand, while the left hand voted against removing the chief architect of the insurrection, the president who nevertheless has now been impeached for inciting it. Oddly enough, along with calls for unity have come unjust comparisons between this unruly mob and the righteous protests of the Black Lives Matter movement those who took to the streets in the summertime to cry out against the murder of black people by police and by other systems of oppression are falsely compared to an attack from conspiracy theorists on democracy itself. On this weekend, when the nation recalls the memory of one of its civil saints, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it's hard not to imagine what Dr. King might have said in comment on this false equivalence. Fortunately, we don't have to guess. We know what he would say because he, in fact, had much to say on this topic. In fact, in a speech he gave to the American Psychological Association in 1967, he drew a clear distinction between riots and insurrections saying urban riots are a special form of violence. They are not insurrections. The rioters are not seeking to seize territory 
or to attain control of institutions. Based on this definition, then, we can easily see that the mostly white mob that stormed the Capitol on the 6th was an insurrection, not a riot, as it had a clear intention of int attaining control of the Capitol and the Congress inside, interrupting the confirmation of the results of the, the election. This contrasts with the demonstrations of the mo Movement for Black Lives in that the summer protest did not seek to dismantle democracy, but to hold it accountable. Dr. King, in this speech, suggested that modern psychology has a name for behavior that doesn't fit the expectations of society's status quo. We call these people maladjusted and suggested further that maybe we need to be maladjusted. We need to refuse to become adjusted to systemic racism. We need to be maladjusted to domestic terrorism. We need to be maladjusted to going along to get along. As people of faith, we have a job to do. We have to rise up and say no we are going forward together, not one step back. So on this MLK weekend, let us recommit to racial equity. Let us call to our minds the names that brought us out into the streets. Mike, Tamir, Trayvon, Sandra, Brianna, George, and so many others. Let us be critical of the voices who would mislead us with false equivalents. Let us resolve not to pursue any unity that does not first demand accountability. And let us commit to being maladjusted to this society. Let us strive forward always toward real, lasting justice. Amen. The Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, was founded in 1886 by the Reverend John A. Parker and just 13 lay people. Parker was born into slavery, so who knows what his dreams possibly were for that church and his ministry. 
He surely would have been proud to know that the church he started back in 1886 became the spiritual home of the civil rights movement. The Ebenezer Church not only counts the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. among its distinguished clergy, but the church actually became, well, let's say a, a family affair. Following the Reverend Parker's ministry, the Reverend A.D. Williams took over the Ebenezer Church's pulpit in 1894. Now, he was the son of a slave preacher from Greene County, Georgia. In addition to great oratory skills, A.D. Williams began to move the church in sync with the social gospel movement, emphasizing activism as a necessary component to a church's vision. The Reverend Williams founded the NAACP in Atlanta and was a major player over time in desegregating the Atlanta police force. By 1927, A.D. Williams took on an assistant pastor by the name of Martin Luther King. King married A.D. Williams' daughter, Alberta, and they gave birth to a son in 1929 whom they named Martin Luther King Jr. So MLK's ties to the Ebenezer Baptist Church go back to his maternal grandfather in 1894. Martin Luther King Sr. became head pastor at Ebenezer in 1931, following the death of his father-in-law. Now, not only did Dr. King Sr. become the pastor, but his wife, Alberta, served as the church's director of music. Ooh, it was all pretty cozy, if you know what I mean. And then Martin Luther King Jr. joined his dad in 1960 with a doctorate in hand from Boston University. And he remained part of the clergy team until his assassination eight years later. Who is Ebenezer? I mean, beyond Ebenezer Scrooge, nobody really comes to mind let alone someone distinguished enough for which to name a church. There never was a biblical personality by that name, but Ebenezer plays an important role during the biblical era of Samuel. In the first book of Samuel, Israel is starting to get its act together finally going through the right and proper motions of religious rituals in order to please God. Now, let me stop myself right here and say that you know I am certainly no biblical scholar, but in my homiletics class in 1973, the great African-American preacher Gardner Taylor gave me 1 Samuel as a class assignment for preaching. Now, nobody ever wanted to disappoint Dr. Gardner, Taylor. So 1 Samuel, <laughs> he became very, very close to me. In fact, Samuel and I were like this. We, we were, he was part of my being. And I'm so glad now, finally, to have a chance to, to pull it back out, wouldn't you know it, just a few months before I retire. Ah, it would have been a shame otherwise. So here we go. In 1 Samuel, Israel experienced a revival after repenting its sins and destroying any false idols that, that they had uh, accumulated. But even as things were going well, the neighboring Philistines decided to attack and wage war against Israel. But, oh, they picked the wrong time to do that because God, God was so pleased with Israel that he delivered unto them some supernatural help. To commemorate the divine victory, Samuel took a stone 
and set it right there on the ground where the enemy was vanquished, and he called it Ebenezer. Samuel said, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Now, isn't that an amazing qualification? Thus far? Uh, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Well, that kind of keeps you on your toes, doesn't it? Ebenezer means stone of hope. So every time an Israelite saw that stone, they would be reminded of the Lord's power and protection. How is it that African Americans struggle through the violence, the tear gas, the dogs, the fire hoses, the humiliation, all through the civil rights movement. It was faith in the power and protection of the Lord. That was their anchor, that was their stone of hope that ultimately they will win the battle as did the Israelites. It's little wonder that one of the most famous lines from Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech in the 1963 March on Washington, that line was when he said, with this faith, we'll be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. A stone of hope. It sure seems that Ebenezer was with Dr. King that day. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. I think what I'm fundamentally asking is where is that stone of hope today in the black community? 50 or 60 years have intervened since Dr. King's peaceful protests made clear that oppressed people still maintain their dignity and that love was indeed more powerful than hate. Dr. King offered a vision from atop this mountain of despair, a vision far from being realized today. But the pursuit had been unifying and powerful all through the Bull Connor era. When Dr. King and Joseph Lowry formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957, their language didn't promise to end segregation or secure voting rights. Now, their focus was, in fact, a little different. I don't know if they were the first to use the phrase. I kind of doubt it. But they said they wanted to redeem the soul of America. And I thought, what a familiar theme that is especially now since Biden kept repeating throughout his campaign that he was fighting for the soul of this nation. Our soul has been in trouble for a long time. Today we see white supremacy still flexing its muscle, structural racism, armed militia, police brutality, mass incarceration, it erodes the soul. It decimates the very heart of what it means to be an American. In 1954, Dr. King delivered a sermon at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, to which he was called as a pastor. And the title of his sermon was what is a man? And his sermon began with a question posed by the psalmist, what Dr. King called one of the most important questions facing any generation. And so the sermon began with, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that thou art mindful of? Of him. King continued, the whole 
political, social, and economic structure of any society is largely determined by its answer to this pressing question. King went on, and I quote, indeed the conflict we witness in the world today between totalitarianism and democracy is at bottom a conflict over the question, what is man? In our generation, the asking of this question has grown to extensive proportions. The sermon was as eloquent as, well, as we could all imagine, even for a young preacher, which he was then. And that sermon ends by Dr. King saying that man's proper home is in the high mountain of truth, beauty, and goodness. I think we'd all agree that in a democracy, the life of every human being must find its home in truth, beauty, and goodness. That's a fitting image for life lived in a democracy, perhaps a bit too utopian, but you got a dream, don't you? In the spring of 1968, in Memphis, where King was ultimately assassinated, it would be helpful to know why he went there to take his last stand for freedom. Two sanitation workers in Memphis were crushed to death in the back of a garbage truck. Black sanitation workers were prohibited from riding in the truck with white workers. They could only ride in the trash compactor area. The two black bodies were literally crushed by the machinery of white supremacy, which regarded these workers as, well, as refuse. And the local churches organized protests with signs that read, if you can just imagine, you know, children, women, families, all lining the streets in their protests, holding a placard that said, I am a man. I am a man. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Do we really need signs to confirm that this body, mind, and spirit, and the muscles, and the heart, and the joy, and the sorrows, and the expressions of love and compassion, that thing was crushed in a garbage truck, was actually a man. I am a man. This exposure of the American soul took place in 1968. And in 2020, 52 years later, another man, George Floyd, was crushed by the machinery of white supremacy. And when you stop for a moment to track all the unarmed black lives shot with impunity by the police, a frightening normalcy has settled upon this nation. We, we recognize now quite easily how I am a man has become the clarion call for Black Lives Matter. Oppression keeps tearing away at the dignity and fundamental humanity of people of color. In Dr. King's prescient words, where he tries to correct white liberal ideas about freedom, he did this way back then. Dr. King said, you know, it's not just about removing barriers that deny equal access to schools, parks, restaurants, libraries, and the like. He said, I cannot be free until I have the opportunity to 
fulfill my capacity. Fulfill my capacity untrammeled by any artificial hindrance or barrier. Now, Dr. King tried to teach a white society, in his words, that the deeper need is for life quality freedom. What a concept. Yeah. Yes, legal rights are important, but it's the fulfillment of total capacity that ultimately defines what freedom really means. The goal is not merely to eliminate racist laws, but to, to complete oneself. The, the problem with liberals, Dr. King pointed out, was their facile acceptance that equal liberties suffice. Then their responsibilities end. Well, Dr. King presented a new term in his essay, Ethical Demands, in which he introduces an image in which he says that only black people can fully understand. And that image that he uses, he describes as social leprosy. Social leprosy, that just, that just sends a chill down my spine. Dr. King lays out the black experience of domination. Social leprosy entails suppressed fears and resentments. Dr. King amplified this point when he wrote, the expressed anxieties and sensitivities make each day of life a turmoil. Every confrontation is another emotional battle in a never-ending war. These experiences constitute the withdrawal of life quality. The expression we find today in the black community, following five decades since Dr. King's legacy, might best be summed up by the African-American artist, Derek Forjure. Now, he was born six years following Dr. King's assassination. Following the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Forjure's latest work digs deeply into the ceremony of black grief and mourning. His focus is on how we mark the lives that have been lost. Now, in his new work called Chorus of Maternal Grief, he commemorates 14 women, from Emmett Till's mother to Breonna Taylor's mother, whom bereavement has forced them into a, a public role. For Jewer says simply, this year, meaning 2020, this year I feel like memorial is important. The black writer and scholar Christina Sharp points out that in addressing black death, we affirm black life. Another recent painting by Forjure is called Paul Bearers, inspired by the lavish funeral given George Floyd. The painting represents men in top hats in a flattened perspective that conveys rhythm and immediacy. For Jure says that the casket itself is the subject of the painting. A man commemorated in a gold casket contrasting so sharply with the way his life ended. You know, ultimately, artists and playwrights and musicians and dancers are trying in their respective art form, trying so hard to transcend the anguish. But there's also 
real life, vivid and extraordinary changes that offer hope for the soul. And this takes us back to Ebenezer Baptist Church, where their minister, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, was elected as the first black senator in history in the state of Georgia. And let me tell you, he defeated a lot of Philistines. As miraculous as Dr. Warnock's victory was, he too knows personally the effects of white racist domination. Warnock's brother Keith has been in prison for 22 years, serving a lifelong sentence as a first time offender in a drug related offense in which no one was killed, no one was even hurt, no drugs ever hit the street, nobody got high. Keith is a, is a vet from the first Gulf War. And so we see that incarceration demonstrates yet another way of how white supremacy can simply crush a black human being. Dr. Warnick has served the Ebenezer Church since 2005, and he was only their fifth minister since the church was founded. Ebenezer Baptist Church must be on hallowed ground. Their first minister 135 years ago was born into slavery their fifth and last minister, will sit in Congress this week as a black U.S. senator. It's quite a story for a little church, although their membership now numbers around 6,000. Know, they, they have seen it all in the faces of their ministers. They have heard it all from the lips that speak from the pulpit. They've experienced it all through the struggles of their pastors. And they have tasted it all from years of despair and defeat to the glory days of victory at last. Ebenezer, a stone of hope. An actual stone of hope lies inside the church. May another stone of hope rest inside our hearts. Amen.